plenary, uh, good morning for this last plen plenary uh, presentation. It is a great honor for us to have uh, Neil Gershenfeld. As you know, EDOF is an interdisciplinary forum. And if we think about inter interdisciplinarity, G Neil Gershenfeld is probably the right person. Uh, he is trained as a physicist and computer scientist. He's a professor at MIT. He's the director of the Center of Bits and Atoms, and I guess he will explain that. The di director of the Fab Foundation. He's the inventor, actually the inventor of the concept of Fab Labs, which is spreading all over the world and he's president of the Fab Academy. Uh, the techniques of, uh, of the Fab Labs are innovative techniques, but innovating from the technological point of view, but probably more so from the soci uh, so social point of view. And I'm sure that we are going to have a fabulous presentation by Neil Gershenfeld. Thank you, welcome to the end of ESOF. And by very happy coincidence, we didn't plan it this way, but it's a beautiful alignment. This comes in the middle of Fab 14, the meeting of the global network of Fab Labs, which I'll explain. Um, the last, let's see, I'll tell you about two days in Paris in a minute, then uh, activities right now are happening all over France. And then next week, Fab Labs all over the world are gonna be coming to Toulouse. So if you're interested in this talk, stay on in Toulouse and more coming next week. Um, so the, I and a number of colleagues just came from Paris where the mayor of Paris, Annie Hidalgo, hosted cities from around the world joining this Fab City commitment. And the heart of what I wanna explain in the next 45 minutes is this counter. This counter is a 40 year countdown to urban self-sufficiency, to cities that are globally connected for knowledge, but locally self-sufficient to produce what they consume. And so there was a remarkable moment in Paris yesterday, yesterday, where a number of new cities like Mexico City and Seoul and Oakland joined all of these cities starting in a program in Barcelona for urban self-sufficiency. So one of the things I wanna do in the next 45 minutes is explain that. Another way to explain what I'm gonna do is here's uh, Gilles, Gilles, and um, I'd like to introduce you to me. So this is me. Together democratizing access to digital fabrications, allowing anyone to make almost anything. With the technical goal of Fab Labs making Fab Labs, together they are asking and answering how we will live, learn, work, and play in a world where data can become things and things can become data. So, uh, that's a sculpture. Uh, that's a sculpture Gilles made of uh, of my voice saying that. Um, during the first White House Maker Fair, he did one of Obama. Um, that's Obama starting, and what, there's a beautiful picture after this of Obama just sort of doing this <laughs> as he looked at himself um, speaking. So um, uh, that quote is what the next 45 minutes about, but the object itself, which I'm delighted Gio was able to bring here, I'm straightening a wire that doesn't want to stay straight. Um, I itself is an, um, turning me into the object is part of what we're gonna talk about. So let's go to the beginning. In 1952, MIT made the first computer controlled manufacturing machine. This was the first time a computer was connected to a machine to make something. And he, the history of that is in, this is Vannevar Bush who invented modern post-war research. Um, but he also made the last great analog computer, room full of gears and pulleys, and the longer it ran, the worse the answer was. And one of the students who worked on that was, uh, the student was named Claude Shannon, and he got so mad at working on this that he invented our modern notion of digital. So 
the analog computer became a digital computer, and the Whirlwind was the first real-time computer. Um, this filled the whole building at MIT. It got transistorized, that was the TX. The TX was commercialized, spun off from MIT as the PDP, and the PDP was used to invent the internet, and word processing, and video games, and email. And in that picture is two scientists at Bell Labs, uh, um, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, and they're inventing the operating system of the computer that, um, as you look at your phone in the front here and click on it, <laughs> they're inventing the operating system that's working inside of the phone that you're still using today. So that's the computing history. But the ideas behind that are not, sorry, I'm gonna say that also. The ideas behind that are not ones and zeros. Digital is not ones and zeros. What Shannon showed the core insight, one of them, is I'm speaking to you as a wave, and the further it travels, the worse it gets. Instead, I could speak to you as a symbol. I could send symbols encoding what I'm saying. And he showed if the noise is above a threshold, you're guaranteed to decode it wrong. But if the noise is below a threshold, for a linear increase in the resources representing the symbol, the energy, the time, there's an exponential reduction in the error to make a mistake. And so that relationship between a linear increase in the resources and an exponential reduction in the error means that unreliable devices can communicate reliably. So that's called a threshold theorem. And that scaling property is the heart of what Shannon did and that's what gave us the internet. Then von Neumann directly, he met Shannon at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he applied Shannon to computing to show that if you compute with a symbol instead of gears and pulleys, an unreliable device can compute reliably. And so now we have uh, personal computers and the smartphone you carry with you. So those are the ideas behind the digital revolution. So now let's relate them projecting forward to fabrication. Around the time of the first, um, when the computer was getting transistorized, this is Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, and he wrote this wonderful article called Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. Um, and this article, you might have heard of the phrase Moore's Law. Uh, in that article, he made the most famous graph in history. Uh, five points, five data points and he's looking at the number of transistors on an integrated circuit. And it was going from one to two to four to eight. And he noticed if you plot the number, it looks like nothing's happening. But if you take the logarithm, which measures doubling, they line up on a straight line. And he said, ooh, they're, they're, they're doubling. It's not increasing at a steady rate, it's doubling. And so he made this graph and said, what if this continues for 10 years? And so in this paper, he foretells just about everything you do with a computer today. It's really prescient, you should read it. He got one thing wrong, which is it actually was 50 years. So for 50 years, it's been doubling. Um, and he could see that starting all, all the way back in 1965. Now on a linear graph, it looks like nothing was happening and then boom, there was a revolution around 2000. But on the logarithmic graph, all the way back in 1965, you could just see it, it's marching along. So that's the digital revolution in communication and computation. Now, here's Sherry Lassiter. Um, she manages the Fab Lab network. She doesn't manage her desk very well, though. She has a very messy desk. And as the Fab Labs grew, there was this pile of papers on her desk, and it started doubling. And she said, it's sort of like Moore's Law. Um, so I recently wrote a book. And in the book, I took the data on Fab Labs, and this is what it looked like. Um, this is 10 years of Fab Labs doubling. Doubling time is a year and a half, just lines up beautifully on a straight line. And so what we're really here for today in this meeting, Fab 14, is to ask, what if that continues for the next 40 years? And that's what I want to try to talk through. So data point number one is there was the whirlwind, there was just one of them, the first real-time computer, and then there was the first computer-controlled NC mill, just one of those. Um, the lab I run at MIT has the million-dollar descendants of those, 
And we use that to do things like we made the first um, significant faster than classical quantum computation. We were part of creating the minimal um, synthetic organism, uh, cryptography and materials, universal logic and fluidics. These are the sort of research things we do with the million dollar fabrication tools. Um, with them, let's see, I have colleagues from CERN here. Um, over, the, let's see, where are you? Um, colleagues, I can't see, but colleagues from CERN are here. And this was a talk I gave at CERN on why computer science was one of the worst things ever to happen to computers or to science. Because it's unphysical, it's based on a fiction that computing happens in a pretend world that has no connection to the physical world. And I feel justified in saying that because one of my students, Jason, built and still runs all the computers at Facebook. And another student, Rafi, built and used to run, uh, handed it off now, all the computers at Twitter. Um, and they can do that because they don't believe in computer science. Their job is to take billions of dollars going from tens to hundreds of megawatts, tons of mass, and turn it into information. And you can't pretend there's software decoupled from hardware. They have to understand how the electrons relate all the way through to the information at the top in this much deeper way. And so it's not that computing is the worst thing, it's the abstraction that computing isn't physical is the worst thing. So these are some of the students who have come out of the research we're doing at MIT. But now to start scaling. Uh, mini computers cost about $100,000. They filled a room. There was about 1,000 of them. 1,000 is an interesting number. That's the number of cities on Earth, major cities, and that's also the number of fab labs today at this moment. So where they came from is at MIT to teach those students to use the machines, I began this class. It was aimed at a few research students, but hundreds would show up to try to get into it and they did the most amazing thing. So a star the first year was Kelly. Uh, this was her project. Um, Hi, I'm Kelly, and this is my screen bomb. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work, or you're in the bathroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of Screen Bobby is a portable space for screaming. When a user screams into Screen Bobby, their scream is summarized. It is also recorded for later release where, when, and how the user chooses. Uh, this is a web browser for parrots. This is an alarm clock you wrestle with. Uh, this one is a dress instrumented with sensors and spines, so if somebody creepy comes too close, it defends your personal space. And what I realized is the students were answering a question I didn't ask. I was asking how to do digital fabrication, data to things and things to data, but not why. They were showing the killer app of digital fabrication is personal fabrication, not mass production, but personal production. So MIT spun off DEC that made PDPs that made the internet. This is uh, Ken Olson, the founder of DEC, famously saying nobody needs a computer at home. That was when PCs came and DEC soon failed. They failed to make the transition from business computing to personal computing. And that's where we're at today. It's not manufacturing as a business, it's manufacturing as something that's personally empowering. So around this time, the National Science Foundation said, um, when Sherry and I spend so much tax money, you have to um, do social impact. And because Congress passed a law on that. And we didn't know how to do it, but we thought the machines were cool. So rather than telling people about it, we set up um, not the $10 million lab we were running, but about the $100,000 lab with smaller versions of these tools for digital fabrication. It includes the 3D printer that you've heard a lot about,
But in many ways, the 3D printer is the saddest, most neglected part of the lab because all these other machines let you make bigger things or make things faster or make things with more function. It's all digital fabrication, but only one of the processes is printing. And that's been misrepresented in the press. So think of this whole thing like the mini computer. It's about 10 machines, but data comes in. And with the things in there, this one is that if you've seen a town being destroyed by a volcano in Iceland, that's Vestmanair. So that's this one. It's a tiny island. It's a dot off the coast of Iceland. But in that lab and in Blair's lab in Detroit and in um, Jean-Michel's lab in Grenoble, um, you can make boats, bicycles, furniture, houses, consumer electronics, production tooling. All of these are made in one of these uh, fab labs. And then an accident happened. We opened one of them in inner city Boston, expecting to be done and go back to work in the lab. But Ghana wanted one. And then we opened one in Sekundi Takarati in Ghana. And then South Africa wanted one. And then we started in Pretoria and then went to Sosungovi. And then they started doubling. And so they've been doubling in number every year and a half. And we're about 1,200 of these labs now, each one of these with the tools I showed you. And so um, Blair runs an amazing lab in Detroit, where you've heard a lot about like bankruptcy in Detroit. But he's buying up uh, available parts of the inner city. And in the lab, um, really pioneering an interesting model where about a third of the time in the lab is producing for commercial gain, for money. A third is producing, but not for money, for barter and exchange and a post-salary economy. And a third isn't for business. It's for art. It's for play. It's for infrastructure. It's for community transfer transformation. Really exploring um, uh, if anybody can make anything, what, what is work? Um, here, let me point. The, this lab is in. Bhutan, this is the prime minister of Bhutan. Bhutan is based on gross national happiness, but they buy crap trucked in from India. And so this is to produce what they consume. This is in Holan, a mixed community in Israel. Uh, this is in Alaska, where Alaska natives have amazing cultural traditions, but terrible suicide, alcoholism, unemployment. And so it's taking traditional materials and crafts, but merging them with modern technology. This is an arts colony in Maine. Um, this is uh, labs we have at the peace walls, which are really the war walls in Belfast and Derry, um, in Northern Ireland, where kids come from both sides um, uh, and transcend religious boundaries to work together in the lab. Over and over, these are showing that the most important thing made in these fab labs isn't the product, it's, it's the act of the making, the benefit for the community of uh, making these things. Um, so in turn, to keep up with that, uh, we couldn't fit all the students at MIT. So we started a program called the Fab Academy that Jean-Michel and Luciano uh, helped create, where MIT is like a mainframe. You go there for processing. Um, online classes are like time sharing. They're still the, the mainframe, and you're a terminal connected to it. I don't really like that model. The way the Fab Academy works has students have peers in work groups with mentors in the labs locally. Then we connect them globally with video and content sharing. So it's not distance learning, which is sort of like the bitnet. It's distributed learning, which is how the internet works. So that's the Fab Academy. Then my colleague, George Church, who's one of the leaders in synthetic biology, used this to start teaching a class how to grow almost anything, where you use a fab lab to make a bio lab, and then you learn biotechnology. And then it inspired another class, a fab academy, to teach textile academies, using this whole campus network, using this whole lab network as a distributed educational campus. And that spun off all sorts of programs. There's an aquaponics. A uh, program that spun off from that, a citizen science program, drone production in fab labs, but not to sell the drones, but use the drones to produce geospatial data. These are all programs that grew out of fab academy projects. Um, and so then that led, led up to uh, what's happening here is uh, this is Barcelona's mayor, Triac. And around this point, uh, Barcelona has fabulous design sense, but youth unemployment is over 50%. It's a, a terrible number. A whole generation can't leave home and work in the, as we understand it. Um, and so 
uh, a colleague who started the first Fab Lab in Barca Barcelona, Vicente Gayart, became the city architect, the planner of the city. And that collaboration led to putting Fab Labs in every district in the city as part of urban infrastructure. The idea is if you live in the city, um, in the same way the city provides electricity and clean water, they now pr provide the means to produce, the means to make. And so it's not protectionism, uh, but the goal is, today they describe the city as a pito. It's products in, trash out. Products go in one side, and the city is a product to trash conversion device. Instead, they want dito. They want data to come in and data to go out. Globally connected for knowledge, but the atoms stay, self-sufficient to produce what they consume. And so we started a counter, and it's 40 years. And the 40 years align with the scaling roadmap I'm going to take you through a few percent a year for the city to produce what it consumes. Um, from there, this was a lab we ran at the White House where Gilles' sculpture was. And then that led to this very interesting legislation. I'm United States Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm one of the few members of the United States House of Representatives who was a scientist before entering politics. So I often tell people that I represent about one-third of the strategic reserve of physicists in Congress. But when I came into work each day in physics, my first stop often wasn't to my office computer or some meeting, but to the laboratory machine shop to check on the progress of some parts that I designed for an experiment or for part of an accelerator. So I can think that, I believe I can safely say that I'm the only member of the United States Congress that knows how to program numerically controlled machine tools. I'm proud to announce that I recently introduced legislation in the United States House of Representatives which supports the goals and mission of the National Fab Lab Network as in the best interests of our people and the best interests of promoting the goals of greater science and technical education, greater access to research and production tools, and empowerment of individuals to understand and use technology to improve their lives. You can think of the NFLN as a new kind of national lab in the United States that's a cloud laboratory, a national network of connected local labs. I've been lucky to have the chance to visit Neil and see the So, um, in fact, I just realized uh, this is Rush Holtz, who, of course, has spoken at this meeting at this lab at the White House. And what we're the goal of this legislation is universal access. In the same way we have universal access to communication and computation, the goal is universal access to digital fabrication, to the means of production as being in the national interest. Um, and so the way to understand all of this is Fab Foundation, Fab Academy, all of these things are like in the mini computer era, these organizations emerge, and these are the organizations that run the internet. The technology of the mini computer is many times over obsolete, but the organizational structure that emerged at that moment in history we're still living with today, both their strengths and actually many of their issues. In the same sense, today we're now inventing the Fab Lab will end up as a molecular assembler in your pocket, which I'll describe in a minute, but we're building the organizational structure that goes with it that doesn't fit how it's done today, inventing new kinds of organizations for this new world emerging. So let's keep scaling. Um, that's the Al MITS Altair. It didn't come from MIT, it came from engineers at White Sands, but they called it MITS because they thought if it sounded like MIT, you would do better. And uh, there are about a million of these, and a million is an interesting number. That's the number of towns on Earth. And the Altair was um, personal, you could own it, but not particularly useful, it couldn't do much. But a business got started on the Altair to program it called Micro Dash Soft, and they eventually removed the dash, and so it was Gates and Balmer. And um, when the Altair emerged, it led to a group meeting to use it, which was called the Homebrew Computer Club that, of course, became Apple. And so a whole generation of computing pioneers started there. And so the analog for Fab Labs is not a million, $100,000 room-filling labs, but instead what's emerging is this is rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping. So this is using a Fab Lab to make the machines in a Fab Lab. And so, uh, for example, uh, and audio can be down for this. Um, uh, this is um, 
a student who used the tools in a fab lab to make a whole fab facility that fits in a briefcase's carry-on luggage, and it has interchangeable heads, and you can use it as a printer to make parts, as a milling machine to make uh, circuits, as a cutter to plot forms, and so it's a whole little fab facility in a briefcase. But what's interesting about the fab facility in a briefcase is if you want one, you don't have to buy one, you can just go to a fab lab and make one. And so that's led to a number of commercial products spun off from it, but more than that, um, historically, there's, you think of what you want to design, then it goes to somebody else who does CAD to design it, then it goes to somebody else who does CAM, which is to turn it into machine construction, then it goes to somebody else who does machine control, which tells the machine what to do, and then I'm starting to go off the end of the stage, then it goes to somebody else who does motion control, that tells the motors what to do, and eventually you get to an actuator that does something. And so in this world of rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping, you need the math to talk directly to the motors. And so there's a beautiful story about work we've done with groups like Dassault SolidWorks and Autodesk um, on how to um, uh, directly let algorithms and math and design talk to the means to make end to end. And I won't I can tell you more later, but uh, you have to revisit a lot of assumptions and how all of that works. And so what that's leading to is fab labs making fab labs. A great example of that is that this is Jens Bivik, a designer from Norway. He was so taken by fab labs, uh, he spent two years touring the world, visiting fab labs. In this picture, he had just come from a fab lab in Japan, and he's at a fab lab in Kisumu in western Kenya, and that's Obama's grandmother who lives next to the lab and he's bringing slippers with Obama's um, portrait designed in Japan and produced in Kenya and giving them to Obama's grandmother. And what you see in the foreground is machines from, that Jens has designed, and it looks like a conventional machine, but it's not. The whole machine is made out of a modular design that you can compose with a modular control system, and the whole machine is made in a fab lab. And so if you want one of those, you go to the fab lab and can make another one. So computing then went to a billion. A billion is when we got to on the order of the number of people on Earth. And that, that's when things like smartphones and tablets appeared. And so we're getting down to individuals. So on the left, we've gone from Earth to Boston to Davis Square, the town I live in, to now the street I live in. And here there's a problem. The top of the in the fab lab, you can make almost anything, everything I showed you. You can make food, you can make energy, you can do all of that. But the top of the screen is the inventory. This is what you need to source to run a fab lab. This is resins and tooling and all of, not the machines, but all the consumables. And then I've, on the bottom, I've zoomed into the electronics part of the inventory. And so you need all of that in a fab lab today. Biology doesn't do it. Um, you're made from an inventory of 20 parts. They're called amino acids. They're like molecular Lego. And what's interesting about amino acids is they're not interesting. <laughs> they have basic properties, like they're hydrophobic and hydrophilic. They're basic and acidic. They have these very simple properties, but you can compose them to make the motors that are moving me and the synapses I'm using to think. Um, those simple properties you can compose to create life. So 20 parts makes you. Uh, you can design with that directly. And so my lab was part of a collaboration to make completely synthetic organisms. But what we're doing is the same thing with non-biological materials. So in the fab lab, we have electronic components to make circuits, and they include resistors. The vendor we buy resistors from is DigiKey. DigiKey stocks 500,000 resistors, not an inventory. They stock 500,000 different types of resistors, each with an inventory. 500,000 types of capacitors, 500,000 types of inductors, but each of those is made out of just three properties, conducting, insulative, resistive. In theory, the whole thing could be an inventory of three. And so what we're doing is um, developing assemblers. So this lets you design electronics by bricks of functional material. Then you model, you place them, you model the physics, you um, export it to an assembler. And then this is a machine that's not a printer or a cutter. 
um, it's an assembler. It takes a feedstock of parts and places them to construct. And so these are digital materials. And by digital materials, what I mean is 3D printing is analog. As beautiful as that is, halfway through the print, if it delaminates, you end up with a tangle of spaghetti, as I'm sure you've done often. Um, think about Lego. Lego works just like amino acids. You don't need a ruler to place Lego because the geometry comes from the parts. The Lego tower is more accurate than the child because you can detect and correct errors. You can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar materials, and there's no Lego trash. You take it apart and you reuse it again. Trash is an analog concept. And so those are all of the ideas Shannon and von Neumann taught us about digital, but now it's digital in the material construction. So what you're looking at is nano Lego, and to reduce the inventory of Fab Labs from these thousands of things down to tens of things, further out, we're going from printing and cutting to assembling and disassembling, digitizing. Um, we're doing the same thing on bigger scales. Uh, this is work um, we've done with uh, Airbus and NASA to make, uh, today to make a jumbo jet, you need a tool the size of the jumbo jet to make the jumbo jet. Here, what we're doing is we're making robots that can walk on cellular structures made out of large numbers of small parts. And it turns out when you make them out of carbon fiber, the materials actually are better than the big carbon fiber parts. And then these robots can collaborate to build um, things like airplanes that can flap their wings, that can change shape by coding their construction out of large numbers of simple parts. And so all of that is digitizing not just the designs, but the materials themselves. So let's keep scaling. Uh, the internet is heading towards a trillion devices, like the smart thermostat. Uh, what's interesting about that smart thermostat is the thermostat has roughly the computing power of the mini computer. So the thermostat can do all the things the mini computer could do. And so computing went from one to a thousand to a million to a billion to a trillion. And when I say that, it's not a metaphor, it's literal. There are a trillion things with the power of the first computer. And the trillion, the way to understand that is a typical number of the things a person has is about a thousand. So there's on the order of a billion people, each with a thousand things, and so there's about a trillion things on the planet. So then here there's a problem. Let's say I wanted to make this remote I'm holding with that assembler I showed you. To make the basic structure of this would take about a day. But if I want to make this all the way down to the smallest part of the smallest transistor, it would take three million years for the time to span from the littlest part to the biggest part. So three million years is too long to wait for an output from a machine. Um, uh, but the beautiful solution in biology is the ribosome, the assembler that makes you, that works just like the machine I showed you, is really slow. It assembles one molecule a second. You make an elephant one molecule a second. But the trick is the assembler can make an assembler. So ribosomes make ribosomes. So a cell can have a million ribosomes. You can have 10 to the 13 cells in the body which means as you're sitting here listening to me, you're placing on the order of 10 to the 18 parts per second. It's done really slowly, one a second, but you have an exponential increase in the number of assemblers. And so um, you can design those directly. So this is the work I alluded to where, where in a computer we design a molecular system, a cell from scratch, and then print out the cell and boot it up but here you're limited to biological materials. In biology, there's this beautiful hierarchy. There's a code, the genome. When you transcribe it, it makes geometrical shapes, motifs like helices. Um, those assemble into functional units like electron donors and acceptors. And then those assemble into machines like the motors moving me right now. So that's primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure. What we're developing in the research behind Fab Labs is the same story for digital fabrication of 
parts becoming functions, becoming modules, becoming systems, and leading up to this is the design of an assembler that can assemble itself out of the parts that it's assembling. It's a self-assembling machine. And so for where we are right now, these are a small set of parts that do mechanisms, that do logic, that do actuation. Uh, here's a motor made this way with just a few parts. Um, this is an actuator to move parts of the machine and then you can merge it with the logic and the construction to make um, a machine ultimately that can do this. So th uh, each of these is one of the parts I showed you on the last slide. This is a design tool to design a machine that can communicate a computation for its own construction. You have to completely merge the design of logic, of structure, of function, all those separate disciplines into this one environment to design complete functional systems. Now, what's interesting about that is uh, early on, I complained about computer science. Uh, the two founders of modern computer science both ended up exactly at what I just showed you. So the last thing von Neumann did was study self-reproducing automata. So first, to step back, he's credited with the von Neumann architecture. He never wrote about it. The only thing he did is this draft report that's a pretty terrible document about a hack to make an early computer work. What he wrote beautifully about was self-reproducing automata, how to design a machine that communicates a computation for its own construction. He wanted to do that to understand the essence of life. That was a theoretical thing, but what I just showed you is research to actually make the von Neumann assembler. Likewise, Turing, Turing's machine, uh, that's the theoretical foundation of computing was never meant to be an architecture. The computer you're probably still looking at, looking around the room, um, is wasting a lot of time because it's emulating the Turing machine. The last thing Turing studied was morphogenesis, was how genes give rise to form. Your genome doesn't store the fact you have five fingers. It stores a program that when it's executed gives you five fingers. And he was studying how um, form becomes function in biology. So they both ended up at exactly this beautiful point of a third, fabrication being a third digital revolution doesn't mean computation is here, communication is there, and fabrication is here. It means they all merge. You merge communication and computation with fabrication by looking at how information becomes physical and physical things become information. Um, one more way to understand that is uh, this was a fun program I did with Bill Nye and a group of other interesting people that's bonus material for the movie The Martian. And so getting at this question of how do you bootstrap a technological civilization? What are the minimum building blocks for a viable civilization? And so there's a lovely series of books by Gingery where book one is how to make a charcoal furnace, book two is how to use the charcoal furnace to make hand tools, and then book seven, you end up with a machine shop. And there's an assumption that that's what you have to do on Mars. You have to repeat the Industrial Revolution. But now you should be able to recognize the slides behind me. What we're realizing is to create a technological civilization, you don't need the 500,000 resistors. You just need these 20 properties, like conducting, insulating, semiconducting. And then you compose them to create all of modern technology. And at that stage, the notion of machine disappears as it does with you, and the machines merge with the materials. Um, and so where that now, to take that question on how do you bootstrap a civilization on Mars back to Earth and ask how we bootstrap a civilization on Earth, which is in some ways a question right now. Uh, if you look at the most sensitive, difficult battles that might be depressing you if you read the news in the morning, over tariff, import quotas, immigrants, all of these vexed issues, they're all really about a false dichotomy. They're assuming that you need work to get jobs, to get money, to get products, and that products come from global supply chains or you fight about barriers. But if data can flow freely, the bits uh, come and go, but the atoms stay, then there's a very different notion of how an economy works. 
where instead of work for money for consumption, consumers can become creators. And it's not utopia, and it doesn't mean everybody does everything. You could make something for yourself, you could make it for a friend, you could do it in a family, you could do it in a community. It could be for work, it could be for barter, it could be for enrichment. Um, but all around the world, for example, Barcelona's had a lot of coverage about Catalan separatists versus Madrid nationalists. But meanwhile, over here, multiple generations of the leadership of Barcelona has been developing this Fab City project. They're now taking a whole district in Barcelona, Poblenau, and remaking it um, in this image to make a whole maker district. Uh, you know, Blair's example in Detroit, all over the world where the press is covering these vexed battles, there's a whole other community not fighting them, but really doing an end run around them, just sort of sidestepping them. And th those battles are a false dichotomy. Um, the technology is there, it's here today. Um, the challenge is building the organizational structure to keep up with it. And so to come back to ESOF, uh, this is a piece I wrote on, is MIT obsolete? And the reason I wrote it is, in the same time we created a thousand fab labs, each with a few hundred people, um, I helped plan one building at MIT, and that one building took a decade to build and cost $100 million. And so you have to ask, what activities justify $1,000 a square foot, and what can be done in this much more scalable way? So this number, in many ways, I consider a problem, not a good thing. The economic output of businesses spun off from MIT, depending on how you count, is the world's 11th economy, so businesses from MIT fall between the economic output of India and Russia. And that's crazy. How can a few thousand people match the economic output of a billion people? Well, it's not that these are the few thousand clever people on Earth. It's this is a productive environment where they can work effectively, but every time we open a fab lab, MIT, I think Luciano here has the record of setting up the most fab labs personally, maybe a hundred of them. And whether they're in Arctic villages or African shanty towns or rural India, wherever we open them, we find exactly the same bright inventive people that we find at MIT. And th they, they're refugees from dysfunctional school systems and dreadful businesses, and they come to the lab um, to connect locally into these global networks. And so really the opportunity here is by orders of magnitude to tap more of the brain power of the planet. Not do it yourself, not make a pilgrimage to an institution far away, but instead of aid, education, industry, research, play, each being a separate activity, when you can go from bits to atoms, they kind of all turn on their side and merge, and you can link them into these global networks. So that's a tour of computing from one to a thousand to a million to a billion to a trillion. And now a tour of fabrication from one to a thousand to a million to a billion to a trillion. And that's not a metaphor. I mean it literally. In the same way the Nest thermostat has the power of the mini computer, today we have a thousand fab labs. We're going to get to a million not room filling rooms, but fab labs making fab labs. We're going to get to a billion assemblers and then a trillion self assemblers. But what's emerging at this moment in history is new models of education. We didn't set out to create all these organizations, but we tripped over incumbents. On aid, we work with philanthropies and aid groups, and by rules, that they, they risk reduce. They, 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 they prove efficacy, and what we're doing is we're delivering invention, and so they just didn't know how to do it, so we had to create a fab foundation. Um, we tried to work with schools and education, and they all said, right, here's the rules, here's the lesson plan, here's the steps, here's what everybody has to do, and, we explain, no, that's, you know, uh, what MI I describe MIT's core competence as it's a safe place for strange people. <laughs> we don't tell them what to do, we sort of prevent not getting in their way. Um, and so we had to create this educational program. Each of these steps, we had to build this new organizational structure. If you take the computing story, it took uh, decades to face up to income inequality and spam and fake news and all of that. It wasn't a problem in the early internet era, but as it grew, it's a problem. Right now, it's not yet a problem here because we all know each other, but we're heading towards the scale in thousand million billion, and we're gonna be living with these organizations for decades to come. And so this isn't just 
making things. It's really getting at the heart of how does a society function? How do we pay for it? How do you learn? How do we collaborate? And it's really getting at some of the most intractable problems we face today connected to some of the most profound emerging technologies when digital becomes physical, when you merge communication, computation, and fabrication. And so I'll end with a remote that just lost. OK. Um, the last slide is where I usually stop, and you clap, and you think this was a good talk. That's in, maybe. That's interesting. Um, and then if you would listen, you'd hear my brother's groaning. <laughs> Uh, my younger brother developed and ran the biggest video game studio, Activision, and now he does games for education and social change. Uh, my older brother led the Industrial Laborations, Labor Relations Association as a leader in the future of work, and they would hear the roadmap I provided, a thousand million billion trillion, and accept the technical roadmap, but then conclude I'm being hopelessly naive about how things can go off the rails in society, and we really need to engage now in the equivalent of spam and fake news and inequality, but in this new world emerging of anybody can make anything. And rather than waiting decades for it, really tackle it now. None of us know how to do it, but we can both see the opportunity and provide the compelling examples and the challenge, and we're gonna be living this with decades to come. So the graph I showed you here um, the, oh, I, let's see, I don't have it here. The graph I showed you of the scaling, we've come to call Lass's Law um, for the scaling of digital fabrication. And every sign we have of the data, the research, all of that, is it's gonna continue for the next 40 years, and it's gonna really lead to this profound transformation. Um, that's the challenge, and that's the opportunity. Um, instead of um, science being something done by elite scientists, we're essentially going to turn the whole world into scientists by not telling them about science, but providing the means to do science and engage much more of the brain power of the planet. So with that, I think we're at time. So I'll thank you and be happy to just take questions informally up front afterwards. Oh, is there time for questions? Oh, if there's time for questions. OK, if there's time, I, sure. Uh, let's see, if you have questions or comments, if, see, if you shout them out, I can repeat them. Yeah. I told you, if you shout it out, I'll repeat it. Uh, no, I can hear. I'll repeat. Or, okay, I guess. Okay, go ahead. Make sure there's one question. Yeah, uh, I can hear you in the back. If you say it, oh, good. Hi, I'm Oksana Mishina of quantum physicist, and I work in Italy and in Germany. And I really like this concept about the self-reproducing autonomy and the uh, trash, the trash which comes from analog and doesn't come from digit. The question is, uh, but digits have to be produced, right? So here I got a little bit lost on the line. Yep. So mm, I probably there is some reduction in something. And so we are saving. I, I trust that. But sure. To the I understand. <laughs> so the answer to your question is um, uh, what are the, when digits are physical, where do they come from? The answer to your question is it's a different answer at each of these powers of 10 to the 3. So at the top, there was just one of them. For the Fab Lab today, what we carefully do is about a third of what's produced in the Fab Lab can use sustainable local materials, fibers, resins, minerals, things we can source locally. Um, sorry, two thirds, or three quarters even. Maybe a quarter of what's in the Fab Lab we have to source globally, like integrated circuits or precision tooling. Um, at Fab 14, it happens we have an amazing um, high school student who made a chip fab in his family's garage, literally, who's going to talk about make your own chip fab. So, but a, a quarter of what's in the fab lab anywhere in the world we have to source globally, three quarters or so has sustainable local materials. 
the step after that, the machines making machines, um, there the core things we're sourcing in the lab are just magnets and coils for motors or power electronics. Um, and then you can bootstrap the rest of the technology there. And in fact, we have a great collaboration. The manufacturing ecosystem in Shenzhen, China, that gets a bad reputation for mass production taking jobs everywhere else, we have a great collaboration with them because they recognize more than anybody that their future of mass production is ending, but what they can do is they can help empower personal production. So that's at that stage. At the assembler stage, where we're going from printing and cutting to this micro Lego, there you need about these 20 material properties. And those, um, there are a number of ways you can mass produce them. You don't need to produce those locally everywhere because they're a standard part. Um, so there's a variety of rolling and stamping processes to mass produce these micro Lego that then you use to do local production. Um, and then finally, those become the self assembler. And so to understand that tour, if you look at software that was either Microsoft and IBM or you learned to program or music that was the record labels or you learned to play the piano, we now have all of these scales of music and software from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to a million to a billion. And so it's the same story here. In the end, we end up with mass production only of the little building blocks that then you irreversibly assemble and disassemble. So it's an important question with different answers at each stage in the scaling roadmap. Just one short question, a short answer. <laughs> I'm never short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marc Pircher, I am a retired engineer. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing. Thank you very much for your, con your presentation. The main thing I think that I will be never be able to build anything in this thing. So w in your mind, what is the future of people like me that will be never able to to do things like that, machine to build machine, to do what, and to be a creator for the next so future. Are you going to be in Toulouse? What on will be my future in this? Are you going to be in Toulouse on Monday? No. Oh, okay. Um, otherwise, I would invite you here. So uh, y y you will be able to make everything I showed you. And um, there's two quick parts to the answer to your question. The reason you can make everything I showed you is in the Fab Lab. There's things you can make um, in the first minutes in the lab, in the first hour in the lab, in the first day, in the first week, in the first month, in the first year. Um, it, it's more like, say, the piano. You can sit at a piano and plink. You can learn to play a few chords. In an hour, you can learn a little melody. In a week, you could learn to play a tune. It might take a decade to become a virtuoso. So. Today, the way we manufacture, in a sense, is you have to be the virtuoso right from the beginning. But the way the Fab Lab works is there's a series of stages. You can learn to do easy things quickly, and then you get mentored from easy to hard. So one part of the answer is, if you are here, and I'll extend this to anybody in the room, if you come to Fab 14, we'll be running a super lab. And in your first minutes in the lab, we'll teach you simple skills to get started, but then help you get the path to go from easy to hard. But then the other point is, if you go again to the examples of, you know, if you take uh, writing software, either you learn to be a programmer or you bought from Microsoft. Now to program, you can do simple scripting on your phone. MIT has a thing called App Inventor that's really popular that makes it easy. There's sort of all these tools to make it easier. In the same sense, you might learn to do all of this. Um, it might be a friend doing with you. It might be somebody in your local community. Um, you don't have to make everything or you don't make nothing. <laughs> it's going to be a very interesting blended mix in between. But there, there, there's on-ramps. It's a trajectory. It's not a cliff where you either make everything or nothing. And I say that with such confidence because we, we, you know, the, the, in the Fab Academy, the youngest person we did it was eight. I don't know the oldest person we had who did it, but we had eight. I don't know if we got up to 80, but retired engineers exactly asking your question. We've taken so many people through this. That's why I can say this with such confidence. And so let me end with, if you find this interesting or exciting, um, you don't need to come to me for approval or anybody here. Just join the network. This is doubling. This is like the growth of the internet. Opt in and become um, part of this and help invent this future. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, I guess we got one more question. Yes, okay. thank you for this brilliant insights.
I'm from the Gambia, and I work in Nigeria as an academic. How do we work with the fab labs to make these mushrooms in African universities and African youths in rural communities? Thank so you. So here, here's the key question in particular about Africa. Um, the first fab lab we did um, in South Africa was in a shiny tech park in Pretoria. And it was kind of a disaster because there were all these rules about who could come in. The second one we did was in Soshangovi, an apartheid era township. And our counterparts in the South African government were petrified because when they grew up, they were told if you went there, you'd be killed. And, and everything there was stolen. And in fact, we did this wonderful lab with the Bright Youth Council, this group in the community, because it was their lab and they took ownership and it was integrated in the life of the community. And the, and the, the South African government took us to the Tishwani Tech Institute, which was really a post-apartheid instrument of oppression that the kids fled from because it didn't teach them anything useful. They made their own educational organizations that we empowered with the Fab Lab and connected them globally. And that same story has recurred in Kenya, it's recurred in Ghana, that everybody wants innovation in a knowledge economy, but over and over we find the existing traditional academic institutions to generalize tend to stifle innovation. They tend to have too many rules and the businesses constrain it and the African innovators flee them. I'm generalizing. But there's sort of this parallel structure we're building up of bright inventive people who don't want to deal with all the rules. But here's the opportunity. It's not just Africa. So the same thing is true in France, that there's a lot of oppressive rules in the formal French educational system. I was just in Saclay yesterday, and a really interesting thing happened. Um, there's emerging a university Paris-Saclay bundled from about 10 existing universities. Um, uh, a pioneer there, Roman, started teaching, started one of these Fab Academy sites completely outside of all the universities, just creating this node that's part of the global network with everything I described. After a few year development, the formal institutions in Saclay have said, this is good, that we'll recognize it so that the students can be part of this global network doing this just-in-time learning, all of that, but at the same time, we'll recognize it as part of our system. So we're not persuading the university to change, we're overlaying the university with this global structure. And so a lot of the next Einstein future Africa development has focused on expensive investments in sort of shiny buildings to create big institutions, um, not how to sort of bring, find inventive people wherever they are and bring it to them. And the way to get there isn't to change your institutions, which is a big journey, and they have roles for what they do, but I think it's these overlays to recognize, again, it's a false dichotomy of either you do everything I just spent the last hour talking about, or you do what you've been doing. You can do what you've been doing at the same time by linking and overlaying with this global network. And the real promise for me is I'm generalizing grossly but the most exciting, innovative, interesting, creative people I've met all over Africa haven't been at the traditional institutions. And so this is a way to sort of bring the innovation to them. Um, that, that would be my answer. And I'd love to help. In fact, the, the row next to you is a dream team that manages everything I'm saying. And so the way to follow up is turn to your right and, and meet them. Okay, right, we're over time. Thank, Thank you. you all.